Good afternoon, everyone. The invitation that came to me to participate in this very special Napa Technology Congress uh, was it indeed a great honor for me, and I certainly accepted the invitation. This is such a special opportunity for me to present to you Building the Creighton Model Fertil Fertility Care System and NAPR Technology Today and for Future Generations. My presentation today, everyone, will be to go back and explain to you how this work started and why it started and how it has developed over these many years to where it is today, which means that this work and the infrastructure that's been, build, been built and everything about Creighton Model and Napper Technology will be available for generations to come. The areas I would like to speak to you about are the following. First of all, Dr. Hilger's lifetime commitment, and then our mission, building the foundation at St. Louis University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. The next area will be how building the foundation continued at Creighton University School of Medicine, and then, of course, the St. Paul VI Institute for the Study of Reproduction. And then the professional infrastructure and the worldwide generational <coughs> impact that this work can truly have um, around the world. And then, of course, a few concluding comments. So I would like to start <laughs> with Dr. Hilgers. Uh, here he is as a fourth year medical student in 1968, the same year that um, Pope Paul VI issued Humanae Vitae. Dr. Hilgers found a copy and he embraced the teaching in the encyclical of love and life that must be connected but he also was very moved by the appeal of the Holy Father to scientists and to medical professionals, to doctors, to become involved. I don't know how many of you have read Humanae Vitae, but it's a very short read. It's not very long at all. But the words in the encyclical were very profound, and I, I'll take a moment to read this. We hold those physicians and medical personnel in the highest esteem who, in the exercise of their profession, value above every human interest the superior demands of their Christian vocation. Let them persevere, therefore, in promoting on every occasion the discovery of solutions inspired by faith and right reason. Let them strive to arouse the conviction and this respect in their associates. Let them also consider as their proper professional duty the task of acquiring all the knowledge needed in this delicate sector so as to be able to give to those married persons who consult them wise counsel and healthy direction, such as they have a right to expect. So you can imagine how these words touched Dr. Hilgers and moved him to accept Humanae Vitae and to do something with it in his professional career. Following medical school, he attended the Mayo Graduate School of Medicine in Obstetrics and Gynecology in Minnesota. As a resident, he was there almost four years. And during that time, he was very involved in the pro-life movement. We met in the pro-life movement. But he was a speaker, an author, and the co-founder of the National Youth Pro-Life Coalition and the International Youth Pro-Life Coalition. We were both involved in these two organizations. And thinking back at that time, here we are now in this very pro-life work, and it's international. Maybe that was the beginning, and we did not know it. I think it was. In 1973, the very, very infamous, the very bad um, Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade, which basically uh, uh, legalized abortion through the nine months of pregnancy was issued. And this was a very devastating um, 
legal op opinion by the Supreme Court, but it, it made us even more motivated to be involved in protecting life and women and families. Since 1973, there have been over 60 million legal abortions in the United States, and, and all of those abortions certainly has, a, a, has had a dramatic negative impact on our culture. Now, during th this time, when Dr. Hilders was a resident, Dr. John Billings came to the United States for the very first time, and he actually came to our home state of Minnesota. And Dr. Hilders and I, we went and we listened to um, met Dr. Billings and listened to him as well. And Dr. Hilgers was very impressed by the role of cervical mucus and also the versatility of the Billings method for all women. Following residency, he accepted a position at St. Louis University School of Medis Medicine. By this time, we were married. And we moved there in August of 1970, August of 1974. Um, and he was hired to do pro-life, um, to do NFP research and to promote pro-life. Perfect for him. So our mission at this time was to begin to build the foundation, although we didn't know exactly what this work would be all about. Now, Dr. Hilger is very dedicated to Humane Vitae. He was certainly a pro-life obstetrician gynecologist. He would never refer a woman for an abortion. And he would also not prescribe the birth control pill. So he needed an effective NFP method for his patients. In 1975, we had the great opportunity to go to Australia and New Zealand on a pro-life speaking tour. And while in Melbourne, Australia, we were able to meet with the doctor's billings for several days. And Dr. Hilders had many questions for Dr. Billings about the ovulation method. And from the beginning of our relationship with the Dr. Billings to this very day, the respect we have for what they accomplished, which helped our work so much, will never change. We are deeply indebted to the Dr. Billings for their commitment and for what they did for the world. Dr. Hilgers then assembled a team of four Ann Preble, Diane Daly, and myself, and we get, began to teach the Billings ovulation method. Dr. Hilgers was our team leader, and he was very clear in our mission to provide the best possible service to our clients based in the teachings of the Catholic Church and Humanae Vitae. We needed to accept the challenge to do things differently, knowing that natural methods really had not met the needs of women and couples for a long time. He received grants from the federal and state government, and his very first published research article, published in Obstetrics and Gynecology, was the verification of the peak day and the timing of ovulation. At this time, Dr. Hilgers was very willing to accept his involvement in this work. However, he's often said he never thought that he would be the only obstetrician gynecologist in the world to dedicate his life to this work. Interestingly, he thought he would only be involved for about a year and a half. <laughs> but since he was so committed to this work and a born researcher, it became obvious as we went on that this was going to be an amazing journey and a lifetime profession for him. During this time, these beginning years, uh, Dr. Hilger's research began to break the code for the menstrual and fertility cycles. As he was seeing um, charts and that, that, show, that pointed to abnormal charting, not normal menstrual cycles, and also knowing that women were experiencing painful medical situations. When we began teaching the Billings Method and during our time there, we found very, very quickly that when women described their observations to us, uh, they were all using different words. And we had such a difficult time to understand exactly each woman, her observations, and her chart. Each, each woman had her own fertility language, and it was very difficult. But we did have individualized follow-ups so that we could work one-on-one -on -one 
with our clients to really understand what they were telling us about their charting, their observations, and their cycles. As a team, we had weekly team meetings so that we could discuss what did we learn this past week and talking to these clients and talking to these women. And we had many questions and then we would work together to answer those questions. Dr. Hilger's second very important published research paper involved the standardization of vulvar observations. The, and this was a landmark study for our work. Um, and this is how the study was conducted. The client would check for mucus. The observation was checked by Dr. Hilgers, the nurse, who is Ann Preble, and the patient. Then a pelvic examination was performed and mucus from the cervix was evaluated. And this data was published in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Now there were 157 women who were involved in this study and there were 400 and 444 observations that um, Dr. Hilgers, um, that went through this, that, that we learned from this process. But after a few hundred observations, Dr. Hilgers began to see that there was a repetition amongst what the women were saying about their observations and what they were observing clinically. So even though women were describing their observations with many different words, there were just very few observations that all the women were seeing. In 1977, <coughs> we published our picture dictionary, which is a critical educational tool for our work since then and to now, 2019 and, for, and forever. And whenever, um, Whenever a good observation of what uh, Dr. Hill, what, what they found to be reflective of what many women were seeing, a medical photographer would come and take a picture. So, we, so only 16 pictures were in this picture dictionary, 16 pictures that represented all of the different categories that all these women, these 157 women, had observed. And I might add now that um, the picture dictionary um, is, it doesn't look like this. That's how it looked in the early days. It was like a, a photograph book. You know, you lift up the plastic pages and put the pictures in. Well, it looks different. It looks different now for sure. All right. Dr. Hilgers then um, developed the vaginal discharge recording system. And when our clients then started to chart, um, the, when they started to chart in the standardized fashion, they would use words, as in this first cycle. You can see their words underneath the stamps, all words. However, in the second cycle, you can see that it's um, the vaginal discharge recording system is now being used by the woman. It allows for the charting to be simpler, more accurate, more concise. And. So the standardization of the biomarkers really, really created for us a new international language of health and fertility, menstrual and fertility cycles. And so keep in mind that women, even though their cycles were unique to them, like our thumbprint is, they were still able to record the uniqueness of their cycles with this standardized terminology. When we would meet at the... Um, when we would conduct our weekly meetings, we realized that we were all teaching our clients different information. We were not all the same in what we were teaching. And some of us were missing important information than, let's say, Diane or Ann was sharing with their clients. So we realized that we had to standardize our Create and Model client teaching materials. And I won't take the time to go through them, but here is a list of them. Anna uh, showed some of them yesterday during her, her presentation on the, on the Creighton model. So the Creighton model, um, where it is today, how it has developed is, is this. It's client focused. A client can use the system for their entire reproductive life. The client is taught by a fertility care practitioner in a confidential setting with one woman or one client couple. And then we have the individual follow-ups for the system to be tailor-made for each client. And the methodological advances, as I've already 
shared with you the objective universal language, the vaginal discharge recording system, and the standardized teaching system, teaching in a standardized format, as well as a case management approach where we always meet the client where they are at. It's the, 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 the man, the, the, the teacher, and the man and the woman. And um, we develop a, this case management approach with every client. We identify the situation problems they may be experiencing and a plan of action and an expected outcome. And we always teach the Creighton Model Fertility Care System as a method both to achieve and avoid pregnancy, a true method of family planning. We, we taught our couples from day one to use the Billings method, not just as a natural method to avoid pregnancy, but as a method to achieve pregnancy as well. So it all began here at St. Louis University School of Medicine in our Natural Family Planning Center. We only worked together less than two years, but we, build, we built at the beginning of an amazing foundation. And uh, here we have Ann Preble with her husband, Tom. Unfortunately, Ann passed away two years ago from cancer. Uh, me. Uh, Dr. Hilgers. <laughs> Uh, who? I know. <laughs> and then Diane Daly and her husband, Tom, and Diane is still, Diane and Ann remained in St. Louis when we moved to, um, when we moved to Omaha, Nebraska. All right, now we're at Creighton University School of Medicine uh, from 1977 to 1984, and building the foundation continues in these three areas, the Creighton Model Teacher Education, the development of NAPR technology, and then the professional foundation begins. Take my time here. Okay. Uh, our very first formal teacher training program was November 28, 1978, and we had about 40 plus students, 40 some students, and they all had to be either users of a natural system or a philosophical acceptor. And the practitioner program was 13 months long, and to this day, there is a practitioner program going on right now as we are here at this moment in Lisbon, Portugal, and it's the same educational program that we conducted in 1978. Of course, it's been updated, but it's 13 months long with um, an educational phase, basic crate and model, supervision, supervised practicum one, the teacher, um, the new intern, the new teacher intern begins to teach the crate and model under supervision with the supervisor. Then educational phase two is the advanced Creighton model, and that's a campus learning like educational phase one. Supervised practicum two, again, our interns continue to teach under direct supervision. Then our, uh, their supervisor visits them at their location and observes them teach, which is very important, our on-site visit, to assist them to refine their teaching skills. And then finally, a fi uh, final certificate examination of about six hours. <laughs> All right, so it was very important to us that we had a professional practitioner educational program that met the needs of every client couple that we would meet. And so Dr. Hilgers developed um, a core curriculum based on allied health standards. And this is, uh, this is a, a picture of our current core curriculum. So we have about 23 accredited practitioner education programs all around, and they all use this core curriculum. It's a standardized core curriculum, so we're all training our teachers in the same way, in an objective way. <coughs> As our work grew and um, we had more and more interests, we did, realized we had to establish five provider categories. Well, the practitioner program in 1978, and the instructor program about the same time, that's uh, only a six month program, not as popular as the practitioner. The educator and supervisor program in 1980 and the medical consultant or doctor program in 1981. Am I talking too fast? All right. Sí. But, yeah. Sí. So what, what, what? Now if you can explain in the <laughs> Yeah. This, what are the differences between these two? What do each people do? Oh, you want to know, do we have time? Okay, the practitioner program teaches the Creighton model fertility care system, and that teacher can teach any couple, any woman from any reproductive category basic and advanced Creighton model, all right? The instructor program is a six-month program, 
And those teachers can only teach couples who have basic, can only teach basic Creighton model. They need to have a practitioner to support them if the case becomes too difficult. And, the, and I'll get to the educator and the supervisor in a moment. And the medical consultant would be for the physicians, for the, med, for the medical. Yes. Otherwise, OK. No, that's, that's important because there's a lot of terminology that is not accessible to, yes. to people who come from the outside. So if somebody has a question, they can, if you okay. can ask so it during. Raise, raise your hand. If you have something, yes. It's better sometimes to answer during rather than at the end. So as co-developers, we realized it would not be possible to educate all the teachers in Omaha. We thought we could. We couldn't. So in 1980, we developed another 13-month program for, from the first class of practitioners in Omaha. And that was the educator program. And the supervisor as well. There's a little difference in what they do, but the educator um, is the one who can um, conduct a practitioner program anywhere, in the United States or anywhere in the world. So it would be like a teacher for practitioners? Yes, right? a teacher for practitioners, yes, absolutely. So 13-month program for practitioners, and then we had practitioners want to come back and do another 13-month program to become an educator. So our very first practitioner program that took place outside of Omaha not, and Dr. Hilders wasn't there, I wasn't there, Ann and Diane weren't there, was in 1984. All right, with that then, I want to move to NAPRA technology and the development of this great science. The important development of the standardization of the biological markers led to the development of NAPRA technology in the 1980s and the 1990s at Creighton University School of Medicine and the Pope Paul the Sixth Institute. And now, Dr. Hilgers was seeing charts that didn't look normal, and this was the beginning of breaking the code for diagnosis and true healing. Remember, he's broken the code now for menstrual and fertility cycles, yes? But now he's going to break the code for true diagnosis um, and healing. All right, so... In Dr. Hilger's textbook that he talked about yesterday that was published in 2004, he said this, the very science of NAPRA technology could not have been developed without the standardization inherent to the crate model system. And I know Dr. Teresa talked about this as well yesterday. And here we have the double helix of the crate model and NAPRA technology. The two are intertwined, they're together. Because it's the first system, Crate and Model, to network family planning with reproductive and gynecologic health monitoring and maintenance, which you all are familiar with. Let's go back for a moment to St. Louis University. April 1st, 1976, our very first introductory session, welcoming new clients to come and learn the Billings Method. Dr. Hilger still remembers that of the couples, there were two infertility couples. And we had nothing to offer them. We didn't have anything that could really serve them, and that really bothered Dr. Hilger. So he made a commitment to himself to find a way to help couples suffering from infertility and not knowing, of course, where that road would lead. <clears throat> so Dr. Hilger's initial research established the normal, and me the normal menstrual and fertility cycles. This slide you saw yesterday by both Dr. Hilgers um, and the first line of charting shows a normal, right, a normal menstrual infertility cycle charted with the Creighton Model Fertility Care System Vaginal Discharge Recording System. What I love about this slide is that the charting reflects accurately the normal home hormonal profile that is going on inside inside that woman while she's charting during the cycle. I, I think it's just so, it's just really almost miraculous that we have this information to share with our, our clients and our couples. All right, now keep in mind at this time now, we're, we're back in Omaha, all right? We're back 1979, early 80s, all right? So we have really begun to train a lot of teachers, and they're not just in Omaha, they're all over the United States. Um, and we had one doctor, Dr. Hilgers, who knew about the charting, right? So what we, 
What we found with these teachers, including Diane and Ann in St. Louis, is that many clients had charts that did not look normal, like the one I just showed you. And and our practitioners did not have answers for them. But the clients knew that their cycles weren't normal either. So these teachers would send all these charts to Dr. Hilgers, say, Dr. Hilgers, can you help these clients? So Dr. Hilgers, also a practitioner, keep in mind, so he was teaching couples at Creighton University School of Medicine. So that gave him a great deal of insight into the, the, the teaching of women. So now he has all of these charts to look at. And so what he observed from the review of these many charts is that women who complained of similar reproductive problems charted similar charting patterns, and the standardized charting was a window to the underlying hormonal events. This slide you saw yesterday by both Dr. Hilgers, and this shows you uh, four examples of, of cycles that are not normal and that are plagued with um, each one with an abnormality or more. So Dr. Hilgers then began um, doing diagnosis with um, ultrasound and um, hormonal profiles to verify what exactly was causing the problems with these menstrual and fertility cycles. And what, I think by 1984, he already had 500 follicular ultrasounds that had been done on, on patients at, at Creighton University. So with this, this data, he began to develop medical, um, and then later surgical, well, a little bit later surgical, cooperative treatments to try to restore the abnormal menstrual and fertility cycles. So, so he could bring hope and healing to women and couples. I have to tell you that Dr. Hilgers, he was emotional yesterday, um, but I think it, it truly comes from the passion that he felt to truly want to help people. And I think that's why doctors go into medicine. They really want to help people. And here Dr. Hilgers was really finding a way to truly help, and that increased his passion tremendously. Uh, I think he mentioned yesterday in 1991 he published this book, um, A Physician's Guide to um, Napper Technology, and in this small book, that's when the term Napper Technology was first introduced. And then you know, um, you know about his textbook, published in 2004, and every obstetrical and gynecological condition has been addressed in this textbook, along with the cooperative treatments vis-a-vis -vis NAPR technology. Uh, several years ago, I did ask Dr. Hilgers, I was, you know, raised, we had five children, I was busy teaching, raising children with him, and I said, what were you thinking at that time when you started putting all of these charts together? And he mentioned this yesterday, if you were at his lecture. And it was very profound when he, what he said to me, he said, I was looking at something no one in the world had ever seen before. It was like, you know, like um, amazing to him. As a researcher, it was very amazing. I'm not a researcher, but to him it was very amazing. All right, so now we have the standardization on these levels that I've just gone over with you. And now we've, we needed to build a professional in infrastructure so that we could really move this work forward. And, and in our own mind, we just felt, you know, if it was going to keep going, we wanted to make sure it would keep going and keep going in the right way. So it would have an important generational impact even beyond when we were no longer involved. So very quickly, I just want to review the infrastructure advances of the Crate Model System and NAPR technology. Um, under Dr. Hilger's leadership in 1981, he felt that we needed a professional organization for our providers, in particular our teachers, so they, that they would maintain quality teaching once they finished the program. So we established um, um, the academy and those, that first group of educators we trained in 1980, they became part of the organizing group, along with Diane, Ann, and myself. Uh, then... Uh, the Pope Paul VI Institute for the Study of Human Reproduction in 1985, Dr. Hilgers has talked about it, and um, changing our terminology from NFP to fertility care in 1999, and then establishing Fertility Care Centers of America in 1999 and Fertility Care Centers International the same year. Uh, I'm just going to move beyond this one just to save a little bit of time. I do want to take a few moments about 
NFP. You know, our work was growing, and we were very excited about our work. We weren't just a natural method to avoid pregnancy. We help couples achieve, and then, of course, the medical science with it. But people weren't paying too much attention to us. <laughs> and so recognizing that, you know, we really weren't tip a typical natural family planning method, uh, which meant that it was a method typically to avoid pregnancy in a natural way. So we decided maybe we had to look for a different word that would reflect our work more accurately. Jack Trout, um, was very famous um, in developing in the, mar in, in the United States, in the marketplace, repositioning in the marketplace. And so we went and visited him, Dr. Hilgers and I, in 1998, and together we came up with the term fertility care. But he, he, he led us to that term. And if you knew everything that we learned from him, it would just... It was just amazing what this man was able to share with us. So then the American Academy of Natural Family Planning changed its name in 1999 to the American Academy of Fertility Care Professionals. All right, I've already mentioned Fertility Care Centers of America established in 1999. Um, Dr. Hilgers was first president, uh, and our son Paul Hilgers is the current president. The purpose of FCCA is to unite and promote crate model educational services through local fertility care centers and to ensure quality control standardization of all the crate model services. Now keep in mind, up until this point, all of our crate model teachers had different names for their teaching centers. They weren't standardized. And they were wonderful names, but they really didn't connect to crate model fertility care always. So now with FCCA, Every new teaching center, or what we call an affiliate, has to have fertility care in the name. So that's the branding, all right? Whether it's in Omaha, whether it's in Argentina, whether it's in Madrid, it needs to have fertility care um, in, in its name. And then, of course, FCCI, um, Dr. Hilgers was the president, he's retiring. <laughs> he's, he's been a man of vision on many levels. And so it's the, sa it's the same idea, to, to unite and promote Crate and Model and NAPR technology worldwide. Let me show you this diagram. This will give you an idea of how it works. This is the FCCI organizational schema. We have a board of directors right now that are from, <coughs> af from Africa, Australia, Europe, the United States. And we make up the board of directors. Then we have worldwide regional affiliates. Fertility Care Centers of Europe, Australasia, Africa, Latin America, all right? And then each worldwide affiliate then would affiliate national affiliates, which would be like a given country, all right? So like in Europe, it would be like Poland, um, Spain, for instance. So you would have the different country affiliates, and then those country affiliates they would actually approve the fertility care centers in their, in, their, in their country. So that gives you a general area, I mean a general idea. Australia is very well organized like um, the United States and Canada, and we're, we definitely are we're developing the organizational structure on the other continents as well as we speak. All right. Let me check my time. Oh, yeah. Nine minutes, you all know, I think, that, uh, that the Institute was founded, um, or the decision to find, found the Institute was um, by Dr. Hilgers on the day that Pope Paul VI died, August 6, 1978. Um, and so, but it took us seven years to open the Institute in 1985. We were at Creighton University. We had a very little space less space than this room. It was very small for our, our follow-ups with our clients, the research area, the patient reception area. It was very, very small. But by God's grace, we were able to open up this our own building, 20-some thousand feet, square feet, um, in 1985. It truly is the international home of the Creighton model system and NAPR technology. We didn't know it would be international in 1985. That grew over time. These are some of our, pro our programs and services. We have the National Center for Procreative Health, which includes our, our clinic, our ultrasound, our National Hormone Laboratory. Um, we have a psychology division. So all of the medical is under the National Center. We have a, our own education department for all the education programs that we conduct and we assist worldwide. We have our own teaching center, Fertility Care Center of Omaha. 
a research division and in the St. John Paul, the Great Fellowship in Medical and Surgical Napotechnology, a year program for our postgraduate obstetrician gynecologists, a publications department, and a NAPRO ethics department, and a chapel of the Holy Family. And we even have established a seminary program that's been tremendously um, successful in three U.S. seminaries. And we're, we've just moved, we just started one now in, in Mexico. So we're very excited about our seminary program. Since 1985, these are some of the Institute's accomplishments. We've trained over 3,000 professionals from all 50 states and six continents. 28 um, uh, graduates of the St. John Paul II Fellowship Program, and they're all over the United States and, and doing great, great work, just like Dr. Hilders, you know, the surgical, the medical, the robot, everything. They're in very high demand. Thousands of patients we've served from all 50 states and many foreign countries, over 53,000 ultrasound exams, over 3,700 cycles of ultrasound study of spontaneous human ovulation, the most of any ultrasound program in the world. Over, well, over 3,800 individuals who have sought um, counsel from our NAPRO ethics department. And we brought our entire, all of our programs to Poland in 2012-2013. Uh, we're currently in a five-year program, educational program in Mexico to build the infrastructure so they can carry it on once we leave. And in 2020, we have an education program in Argentina, 2021, Colombia. So we're really excited about Latin America. Spain, 2019, <laughs> in cooperation with Fertilitas here yeah. in this university, oh, the first education program. That there. would be in Mexico. We're, we're, we have an affiliation with the Pan Americana School of Medicine yeah. in Mexico City, a great relationship. Absolutely. Go for yeah, that. You got it. You got it. Okay, um, in 2004, Dr. Hilders was able to present his textbook to the Holy Father. As a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, he met with the Holy Father on numerous occasions, and every time he would give him something <laughs> about our work, like the, um, he wrote a paper, Napper Technology and Theology of the Body, and he gave that to the Holy Father. And we found out later from his personal uh, priest assistant that the Holy Father read every word, and it, he really agreed with it. And so um, um, uh, St. John Paul II knew about our work, certainly from... Dr. Hilders, but from our Archbishop at the time, Archbishop Eldon Francis Curtis, who is now retired, a huge supporter, and he is the one who told us that the Holy Father told him that the Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska, he would say, Omaha, <laughs> Nebraska, gives me great hope for the future. I had the great blessing of meeting him as well. It was, oh, really, really special as you can imagine. And then in 2004, we met with then Cardinal Ratzinger, a sister Renee Mercus. She is uh, the head of our NAPRO ethics department, me, myself, the Cardinal, and Dr. Hilgers. And when Dr. Hilgers gave him the textbook, the, um, Cardinal Ratzinger looked at the title, of course he could read English, and he goes, ah, new terminology, NAPRO technology. <laughs> And he's got deep blue eyes. You're just like, oh, as deep as the ocean. And then in 2017, Dr. Hilgers, with his leadership, um, called all of the graduates from the um, St. John Paul the Great Society of Procreative Surgeons to Omaha to see if they'd want to establish a professional surgical um, society. Um, there's the American Society for Reproductive Surgeons in the United States, and they do all the mainstream medicine. And Dr. Hilgers felt we needed to have a, a, another society that represented this work. And so it was formed in 2017. This is their... Um, Logo. Logo. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hilgers is not a member of the board. He's there to guide them. So he's passed the baton, if you will, to the next generation of these amazing obstetrician gynecologists. And we have another, we have a son who's also a NAPRO technology doctor, Stephen, and he's in Houston, Texas at Methodist Hospital. So he actually is, is part of this organization. So, um, so we have Teresa and we have Steve as doctors as well. Oh, yes, was my time. Um, you're fine, you're fine. Just a couple more. Generational <laughs> client experiences. We never realized at the beginning that this would be generational work. I want to give you 
maybe two, five times, three examples of what I mean by this. In 1976, back in St. Louis, there was a couple, they were engaged, and they came into our program, all right? They used this, the method their entire reproductive life to have children and to avoid pregnancy up to her menopause and knew that she was moving into menopause because of her charting. There was another couple um, as well from St. Louis, and they came in with infertility. Um, Napper Technology assisted them. They had five children. Um, but interestingly, the mother brought two, the two, two of the teenage daughters back to the same center because she was concerned that they might have medical issues. And yes, um, one had polycystic ovarian, polycystic ovaries, the other one premenstrual syndrome, and they were treated. So as teenagers, the problems were identified early. Isn't that great? Before they were ever to be married or even to have children so that they could be treated. And so generational. And why, um, oh, one more. There was a couple that I just spoke to uh, about two months ago. They were in their 70s, right? And they, they worked with one of our practitioners for many years. And one of their children, their daughter, was suffering from infertility. And the mother said, well, we brought her to Omaha, and she had surgery, and she was able to conceive. So it's, it's pretty, pretty special. So why has this effort continued from one generation to the next? Well, because we've worked so hard to give a good service to these clients and we respect them, we believe we've developed a trust relationship with them. And they know that they can come back and they can have our service whenever they need it, even for their children. So there are three important pillars of our work that really cannot change. The unethical, I mean, excuse me, the unchanging ethical foundation, the published research that verifies effectiveness. We have to have more research, but it has to be good research. And the client-focused educational process. And so we can't move away from that. If we do, we will not be serving our clients in the best possible way. Oh, just a comment on our fertility care app. This is the login page. Um, the official release was September 5th, 2019. And in a world of fertility tracking apps, we bring you something different. Very, very quickly, it took us a long time to develop this app. It's different from any fertility tracking app on the market. And why did it, it, why did it take so long for us to develop this? Because we wanted it to be a sound educational component with the already established teaching process we have for our clients. So this app is not just a tracking app. It has, they can chart, it has instructions for them. There's communication with their practitioner in a secure communication system. Um, it, it's, really, it's really quite amazing. So it's part of the Crate Model Teaching System. And so the focus remains on the client. When so many fertility tracking apps out there, the focus is on the app, and it doesn't really help the women know what's going on. What are my problems? What's happening? But um, our app advances client-focused education in the best interests of the client. And our Crate and Model client teaching materials have been translated or are being translated into 23 languages. The most recent is Arabic. That's right to left. And um, we will be able to translate um, the app into other languages without much difficulty because we think Spanish will be the next one because we already have the basic information already translated. So it will be easy then to move into um, a foreign language um, app. And as I'm concluding here, am I over my time? Yes. Oh, three that's minutes. Fine. Four minutes. Not bad. For me, that's, that's not fine. bad. Four minutes. <laughs> Just ask my husband and my children. <laughs> All right. As I, as I am with you here today, I, I, we never would have dreamed back in St. Louis that we would, that this would go worldwide. And it truly is, truly is amazing. And, um... We thought our, our universe would be then St. Louis and Omaha. But, but why has it grown so much? And from our experience now internationally, we see that the, the problems that women experience, no matter the country, no matter the culture, no matter the language, they're the same problems. The same problems. And so 
our work, which is standardized, right, and it can meet the needs of many women, um, it, 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 it's in high demand. So, as Dr. Hildreth, I think, mentioned yesterday, we're on six continents. I mentioned the translation of the materials. And we have, you know, 21, maybe 23 accredited practitioner education programs. Uh, we have been field testing the teachings of the church for over 40 years. And Father John, John isn't here anymore. But it's so unfortunate that the Catholic Church has been viewed as old-fashioned or not with the times. And actually, the church has been the leader. Sometimes the Catholic Church is so far ahead of the world that the world thinks it's really far behind. But in this case, the church was very far ahead. So the teachings of the church are absolutely spot on. We've witnessed it with our couples. The teachings absolutely bring so much to this work and allow this work to be as effective as it is. So we build strong families through strong couples by assisting couples to understand and live with joy the teachings of the church. Now remember, we don't see just Catholics. You know, ovaries aren't just Catholic ovaries, and ovaries and fallopian tubes aren't just Catholic fallopian tubes, right? But the Holy Father in the encyclical, Humanae Vitae, opened it by saying, to all men of good will. To all men of good will. So that it's for... It's for everybody, and we certainly have seen non-Catholics, others who the truth sets you free, and it resonates with them, and they get it, and they're so appreciative of our effort. So the integrity and quality of the Crate Model Services and NAPR technology needs to be preserved and protected. So as time goes on, I just want to mention this to you because we've seen this in so many movements that are very worthwhile or organizations that as time goes on, there can be a tendency to uh, take shortcuts, forget about something important. <laughs> and with this work, we really have such a responsibility for those we serve. So we really need to preserve the work. Like Dr. Hilders will say, NAPA technology is not NAPA technology without the values that undergird it, undergird it, that support it. So we don't want to take shortcuts um, just because for whatever reason. We're here to serve, and we're here to serve effectively. And so, if anything, we want to build on what's been built upon, but always keeping in mind who our focus is. Why are we doing this? What's our mission? Is to provide the best possible service to those we serve. And as St. John Paul II said, do not be content with anything less than the highest ideals. Amen, Amen. yes? Do not be content with anything less than the highest ideal. So Crate Model and Epic Technology can even go further than it is right now with dedication and moving in the right direction, always at the service of those we, we serve. So in conclusion, building a culture of life and women's health care really involves the heart, we believe, of building the culture of life in women's health care for today, today, November 9th, 2019, and tomorrow, and for future generations. Muchas gracias.